All right, I'd like to continue with Jan van Denberg's A Crash Course in Stars. This is part eight of our video series. Uh, this is Jan van Denberg's study of Ra Uruhu's The Nature of Stars, where we explore the fixed stars. Enjoy. Let's continue. Let's continue. So, following in Ra's footsteps. Aldebaran. To begin with, two clusters in the constellation Taurus. As you will see, both of these particular forces are part of a construct that carries a deep yin nature to it, as it is to be seen in the quarter of civilization. Most of the intelligent thought relative to our relationship to the sky began when the equinox was in Taurus. In those times, Aldebaran was number one, so to say, the Aleph. So what Jan is saying here is that uh, there was kind of the age of Taurus, then the age of Aries, then the age of Pisces. Now we're entering into the age of Aquarius. And you can see that in the age of Aquarius, uh, this is the real humanist era that we're entering into, uh, even post-humanist, maybe. But before this, we have the age of Pisces. This was the Christian era, roughly, the symbol of the fish, the Vesica Pisces. Before that, we had roughly 2,000 years in the, the age of Aries, the age of the ram, symbolized by the ram's horn. And before that, when we get back to 2000 BC, all the way back to 4000 BC, we have the age of the sacred bull, the age of Taurus. So these are just kind of rough uh, time frames. But the idea here is that we've gone through this, these ages with the procession of the equinox. Now, what Jan writes is most of the intelligent thought relative to our relationship to the sky began when the equinox was in Taurus. What he's really saying here is when... Um, the tropical and the sidereal zodiacs lined up to where uh, rather than Aries and Aries being lined up, it was actually before that, it was Taurus and Aries lined up, right? Now, um, right, and then for a while it was Aries and Pisces lined up and then it was moved on to now where Aries and Aquarius line up. So if you think of Aries as the kind of start of the traditional year, you know, for the ancient Romans, uh, the springtime and Aries kind of being the first sign of the zodiac, and zero degrees Aries being the start of the zodiac. What a lot of sidereal astrologers point to is the time when, when Aries, the constellation, lined up to Aries, the sign. And that was the time when the sidereal zodiac lined up to the tropical zodiac, more or less. I say more or less because Sometimes sidereal astrologers will kind of make a big deal about this, like we need to synchronize them again. Well, it's not quite that simple because if you go back further, like we're, we're talking about here, Taurus actually lined up to the spring equinox, not Aries. And if you go back even further, it's Gemini, right? And you can see how some of the symbols of these archetypes were represented in the collective consciousness of the time. As I mentioned, Pisces and Christianity, now the age of Aquarius and this sort of post-Piscean era of humanism and of the Aquarian values. So yeah, this is an interesting, an interesting side point here. And then of course, when, um, when Jan is saying that these are in Taurus and that they are there's a deep yin nature to it, as it's in the quarter of civilization. What he means is, if you look at the wheel, if you look at the, the rave mandala, it's split into four quarters. And each quarter has only one commonality throughout the entire quarter. And that commonality is the bottom diagram, the first two lines, because you know we, we count up hexagrams from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six. And each one will either be yan or it'll be yin. Yan, yin. You know, it'll be an unbroken line or it'll be a broken line. 
And as we're, we're going around the wheel, what we'll see is 16 gates in a row, that is 16 hexagrams in a row, that will be yin yin, the quarter of civilization. 16 hexagrams that are yin yang, the quarter of duality. 16 hexagrams that are yang yang, or yan yan, as it said. Yan is the kind of more traditional and correct uh, pronunciation rather than yang. But, uh, but you hear both. And then we go around to the quarter of initiation, and that's yan yin. So you can see that these fundamental commonalities of the gates are really what define the quarters. And the quarter of civilization is a time of yin, a time of deep yin. So, and, and in the historical time from maybe 2000 to 4000 BC, roughly, when um, the yin was kind of where it all started and when the yin was, was more accented, uh, in some ways at least, Aldebaran was number one, the Aleph. So we can see these are the stars um, of Taurus going into Gemini. We have uh, the Pleiades cluster, Electra, Seleno, Pegeta, Maya, Merope, Asterope, Alcyone, Atlas, and Pleione. The Pleiades, the two parents, Atlas and Pleione, and the seven sisters. So these are the, the two parents. They're at uh, 039 Taurus, or sorry, 039 Gemini and 041 Gemini. And then we really have the Pleiades cluster right at the end of Taurus, right around 29 Taurus to 0 Gemini. And those are the seven sisters there. So now we have the Hyades cluster. Prima Hayadam, Secunda Hayadam, Feo, Chamakui, Ain. Then we have Aldebaran, Aldebaran, the follower of the Pleiades. Astronomically seen, Aldebaran is unrelated to the Hyades, while she's much more close to Earth, which is interesting. Um, so, because, you know, these degrees are where they are along the ecliptic, so it's not really telling us distance. I guess it's saying the Hyades cluster is uh, much farther away from the Earth. And then Antares, 10 Sagittarius. Aldebaran and his relative opposite Antares on the other side of the wheel basically formed the imaginary line upon which everything was calculated. Very interesting, yeah, 10 degrees Gemini to 10 degrees Sagittarius. Gate 16, line 5, and gate 9, line 5. Aldebaran and Antares, very interesting. Alpha Tori and Alpha Scorpi, which I guess is because they're in the constellation of Taurus and Scorpio, um, but of course this gets into the sidereal versus tropical astrology uh, discussion where the tropical degrees are now See, this is going to change over time. Aldebaran is currently at 10 degrees Gemini. Antares is currently at 10 degrees Sagittarius. If you were to go 72 years ago, this would be 9 degrees Gemini and 9 degrees Sagittarius. If you went 720 years ago, this would be 0 degrees Gemini and 0 degrees Sagittarius. And that's because of the, the shifting uh, of the stars against the the division of signs. To follow the cycle of a star through the wheel with all its leads seems the most obvious approach to grasp what the specific impact of a star may be in its movement, operating through the planetary, what it brings out relative to particular eras. So here's the approximately evolutionary movement of Aldebaran. And so this is something that Ra talks about in his Nature of Stars, where um, basically what, what Ra points out is that this is the development moving into gate 16, which is uh, in part of the channel of talent and the gate of skills, and very much about technical skills, logic skills, the expression of skills. It's a throat gate, and it's the expression uh, of skills. That is, um, you know, the expression of skills through basically the ultimate 
the final release of all of the uh, the work that's been done in in the 5818 uh, channel and then up to the 48. 5818 is all of the improvements that are made. 48 is the depth of solutions that are discovered. These finally get released in the 16th gate of skills. And so this is about something like technological process, progress or even technical prowess, the, the ability to have technical logical skills. Well, this really closely, we can see technological advancement, that technological advancement really began in the early 1700s of the modern era of science. You could argue it came a little bit before that. Obviously, we had the cross of planning beginning in 1610, and we had some early proto-scientific texts of the 1500s and earlier alchemical texts and so on. But if you really look from 1711 through our present day, I mean, this is basically, this is the star of science. It transits, um, and remember, it's only going to transit gate 16 once every 25,000 years. So it's very interesting when you see that the fixed stars really, because it's part of the precession of the equinoxes and it takes 72 years to go a single degree, you know, it's close to, it's, what is that? That's 76 years to go a single line, 77 years to go a single line. Oh, sorry, 67 years, my bad. But close to it, right, right, because it's 67 years per single line. I mean, that's still, it's close to the 72 years per degree. This is, right, it's basically the, the stars are moving so slowly relative to us, the sidereal zodiac moving so slowly relative to the tropical zodiac that um, these are very long-term things. And to really interpret it, we have to look at a span of hundreds of years while Aldebaran moves through gate 16. It will leave gate 16. Uh, let's see, this is when it enters the lines. So... 67 years after 2046. So it'll leave in, you know, 20, 2110 or something like that. So Aldebaran will finally stop um, transiting and kind of improving our technology and so on. It'll move into gate 35 sometime in the 22nd century. Very interesting. Meanwhile, Antares has been transiting gate nine, the gate of focus. The movement of Aldebaran into the 16th gate started in the beginning of the 18th century. It stays there till the end of the cycle, that is, uh, till 2027 and beyond. So this movement links to the cross of planning, and that Aldebaran should have a deep impact on that, possibly in relation to the development of skills. Gate 16 is the gate of skills. In fact, the gate of experimentation. It's the voice of, I experiment. Right? When someone says, I'm experimenting with this, I'm seeing what will happen when I do this, I'm trying this out, I'm experimenting in that way, that's all gate 16. With the development of technologies as its greatest success, industrial, technical, service revolution. Using these faces of the Godhead as a part of the mapping gives the genetic information and the dynamics of what its information system is. But it also shows two very female forces ruling these eight gates of the quarter of civilization. With the 4037 as a definition in the cross of planning, it tends to dominate in community sense. That is the nation state and the alliances of nation states and global organizations, global economy, the industrialization of education. All of these things are a byproduct of it. Hmm. However, the underpinning of this cycle has been the detail the ninth gate, after all, this incredible energy for detail work, step by step, going through confusion to fulfill the experiment, gaining the experience to be able to go deeper and deeper into the development of the technologies that support everything that is part of our world. The first important date of the Industrial Revolution was the invention of the first productive steam engine by Thomas Newcomen, 1712. Hmm. Or I wonder if that's Thomas Newcomb. I wonder if that's a, a typo or if that's the correct. Maybe that was Thomas Newcomb. I'm not, I'm not familiar with him. 
Uh, Thomas Newcomen. Yeah, that was his name, Thomas Newcomen, an English inventor who created the atmospheric engine, the first practical fuel burning engine, 1712, an ironmonger by trade. Dartmouth, United Kingdom. Interesting. Hmm. I wonder if we can get a. This is Aldebaran's. Oops. Aldebaran's solar system in the sky. Very interesting. So it has its own little. Its own little complex there. The axis of cosmic time, the imaginary line upon which everything was calculated. Hmm. Very interesting. Autumn equinox and spring equinox. So there was a time when Aldebaran and Antares perfectly lined up then. There was a time when they were the lined up to the equinoxes perfectly. And uh, that's kind of how it's all calculated. That's very interesting. That was when it was in sync, so to speak. So it would be interesting to look at if there is a main player in the ninth, the 40th and 37th gate, and track down how they are unique forces influencing this greater cycle. Another thing in this approach is that there should be this consistency, Aldebaran, influencing different lines. Relating to human design is this incredible synthesis of different layers. It seems in here an appropriate place to include this ancient Middle Eastern understanding of stars. Its relationship with the moon and Mercury was something that was stressed very sharply by the Arabian star mystics. For them, these were instruments of the filtering of Aldebaran. Now it becomes interesting. The rave I Ching contains this extraordinary alignment of planetary information. In any, I guess they're saying the most extraordinary in any esoteric knowledge ever laid out. The conjunction of a certain planet with a certain line gives this well-known fixing. However, in this context, it gives us a way of seeing a very specific impact. Aldebaran, the Aleph in the sky. Following this relationship with the moon and Mercury, it's of course interesting that there is no unique influence of Aldebaran between 1912 and 1979 and after 2046. So interesting because um, there's no, I see, there's no exalt or detriment. So like 1644 has mercury detriment, 1711 has mercury detriment, or sorry, 16, yeah, 161 and 1711. So these are kind of, I guess what he's saying is, when Aldebaran goes through a particular line, if that line has no exaltation or detriment, then there's no unique influence. However, it seems more interesting to look at Aldebaran in the period when Aldebaran, Aldebaran was influencing gate 20, line 5, and gate 20, line 6. Here began our wisdom in terms of our exploration of the values of the heavens. Yeah, gate... So 1644, gate 20, line 6, wisdom. The establishment for the benefit of society, values, ideals, and their patterns, how they could be understood and applied. Very interesting. That is, Aldebaran drives our fascination with the universe pointing us to the sky. And related to the scientific development in the cross of planning period, to see Aldebaran as the mother of all physicists and metaphysicists. This pointing to the sky and the scientific development, these are both mercurial themes. Mercury, the moon, and Aldebaran. And then the difference between, ultimately between the way in which the mercury is going to impact and the way the moon is going to impact. So see, I guess he's referring to here, um, the difference between mercury and moon. You know, these are in different eras as Aldebaran went through uh, these times. 
what a difference it is going to be if you happen to have your natal moon or your natal Mercury there. It's going to be conjunct Aldebaran, particularly if it would be able to conjunct Aldebaran with the moon in this era now, you'll see the most powerful impact of that star in that being's life. So what he's saying is the era we're currently in, if you have the moon in gate 16, line 5, you're going to see Aldebaran really have a very strong impact in that person's life. And of course, that gives them the detriment. A perverse feeling that sharing and enthusiasm hampers individual development. So not wanting to share in the enthusiasm. A lack of confidence in the value of encouraging others. Hmm. To be clear again, this is just, this is still a theoretical approach. But it seems logical that the very recognition of the influence of these objects and the recognition of the influence of these objects over enormous periods of time is evident that they have a unique impact. So it's a matter of discovering the instrument of that impact. I see. So it's like the way to really see Aldebaran at the most is when you have Mercury conjunct Aldebaran, you know, for these time frames, or in our current time frame, the moon. And it's hard to see the impact for people born between 1912 and 1979. Even if they have a planet in gate 16, line 4, it's going to be hard to really see the impact of Aldebaran because it mostly makes its impact known when there's a fixing planet there. I think that's the theory here. Within the mechanics of human design, the only way to integrate with anything is that it has to be an aspect that imprints us. Yeah, so I think that's what they're saying, is it has to imprint. And so, say you take somebody born in 1978, and they have moon in gate 16, line 5. Then you take somebody born in 1980, and they have moon in gate 16, line 5. Both of them are going to have the same refusal to share an enthusiasm, the perverse feeling that sharing enthusiasm hampers individual development. You know, they're both going to have this same, uh, the Grinch, Gate 16, line 5. But the person born after 1979 is going to have Aldebaran. Like, that's when, it, like, it'd be interesting. Yeah, take somebody born in, like, 1950 or 1940, 1930, 1920. They have Gate 16, line 5, moon. Then take somebody born in the 80s or the 90s, Gate 16, line 5, moon. Both of them have the moon in the exact same position. The difference is... These people have, the people born after 1979 have the moon conjunct Aldebaran, the ones before don't. So you could really clearly see the influence of Aldebaran there. Like it would be interesting, it would be, that's the, kind of our only chance to see really how the star does affect someone. Within the mechanics of human design, the only way to integrate with anything is that it has to be an aspect that imprints us. If it's correct that the stars have a specific impact on certain planets, there's no question that the special, unique impact of certain stars in human beings' lives can be seen. For example, somebody with their moon conjunct their node and conjunct the star Aldebaran. That, that, there would be a classic configuration of the deepest possible influence of that star. However, not losing my awe at the construct, the wonder is not there. It is so part of the fabric of illusion these mechanisms are the bedrock of the whole phenomenon that we experience. It's only about the potential to be able to interpret the data and that these particular stars, the ones that have filled those stories, have the greatest potential to impact with the non-contaminated data stream. And being unaware of that enormous ocean effect of density and density cross currents, these stars, the ones that are part of the collective conscious mythology, these stars do have unique impact. And the only way they can have that, because they cannot have that directly on us, is that it has to be filtered. And here's the constellation Taurus containing the Hyades and the Pleiades cluster. It's clear that most of the consciousness ocean is filtered by personality crystals before it ever touches the Earth. We live in a crystal sheath, but it is also clear that it is the stellar relationship the second hand being the power behind the throne in a way, having a special relationship with a planetary object, being able to influence that object. And once that object is influenced, 
the program is influenced. It is an influence that can take place within the individual. In other words, this is a way in which pure stellar data stream can be translated to a human being. Aldebaran is the left and southern eye, and Ein is the right and northern eye. Ein itself is a word that translates as eye. Both Aldebaran and Ein were considered to be the eyes of the bull, that is, the Taurian bull, and the bull being so important. The most ancient mystics considered that everything was in the constellation of Taurus. Ra, I was literally, I was, excuse me, I was clearly told by the voice that we are part of the cosmic Ajna. And again, not to take that literally, but something like that. And that is situated in Taurus. This is a very old story. Some ancient mystics believed everything was in Taurus. Absolutely everything. It was the be-all and the end-all. It seems to me that Aldebaran is definitely related to science. I think that this is the mother of deep scientific influence in the life. I think it is something that brings to the moon and Mercury the potential to communicate science. It brings the potential to be driven to grasp the sciences. So hereafter, some scientific developments related to the sky with Aldebaran's influence in gate 20, line 4, to gate 20, line 6. Some early European science related to the sky. Nicholas Copernicus. In 1543, Nicholas Copernicus published his treatise, The Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, or Coelestium, on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, which presented a heliocentric model of the universe, sun-centered. It was the year, legend says, the day itself, May 24th, he died that it was published. However, in 1509, he already wrote Commentariolis and circulated copies to his friends and colleagues. Curious enough, during Copernicus's lifetime, nothing is known about its influence on contemporary astronomy. Overall, it took about 200 years for a heliocentric model to replace the Ptolemaic model. There's a term, Ptolemization, which means to continue to find ways to keep the old model, to Ptolematize, or to, to Ptolemize maybe, is to continue to um, patch up an old faulty model every time a new inconsistency emerges to find a reason or an excuse that the old way could still work. Another 12 constellations. Of course, the native people of the Southern Hemisphere had already done some of that, but typically were ignored by the visitors from above the equator. It was a pair of Dutch explorers, Pieter Kaiser and Frederick de Houtman, who sailed the Southern Hemisphere in 1595 to 96. Kaiser skimmed the cream by cataloging stars within 12 new, bright, obvious constellations of his own invention. In 1598, the Dutch astronomer Petrus Plantius, 1552 to 1622, inscribed them on his celestial globe, while inclusion in Bayer's great atlas of 1603 rendered them permanent. These are the southern constellations of Frederick de Houtman and Pieter Kieser here. Um, uh, there we go. So the Tucan, the Pavo, Indus, Grus, Phoenix, very cool. Southern constellations, very interesting. In the year 1603, Johannes Bayer published his Uranometria, a star atlas containing charts of all the constellations drawn by a new method and engraved on copper plates. Bayer's systematic approach used the Greek alphabet in order to differentiate the brightness of stars in a constellation. So the first Greek letter, alpha, usually denoted a constellation's brightest star. Beta was the second brightest, and so on. Bayer estimated brightness by eye, so some discrepancies exist. His work gave more than 2,000 stars. Most stars have not been given proper names, relying instead on alphanumeric designations in a star catalog or a star atlas. After him, finding new stars in earlier explored constellations, the same method is continued possibly giving beta two or, uh, and so on. 
these various um, letters of the, the Greek alphabet with numbers. And then here we have the cover of the Uranometria. Galileo Galilei. We have a couple other uh, pictures here. John Flamsteed and Charles Messier, or Messier, probably. Bayer still represented those observing the night sky with the naked eye. This monopoly ended with the invention of the earliest known telescope for military use, which appeared in 1608 in the Netherlands when a patent was submitted by Hans Lippershey, an eyeglass maker. A year later, in 1609, an Italian physicist and astronomer named Galileo Galilei heard of that and started building his own to point it skyward. His observations were welcome, but his conclusions or not. They seemed to completely contradict the rigid position held by the church, that earth and humans were the center of the universe. With the telescope, scientists began to think of stars as natural, physical objects rather than as gods, mystical beings, or portents. And I see, uh, we actually have, uh, there it is. Hmm, not sure how to, here we go. It was on this page that Galileo first noted an observation of the moons of Jupiter. Yeah, so here we have the page where Galileo first noted an observation of the moons of Jupiter. This observation upset the notion that all celestial bodies must revolve around the Earth. Galileo published a full description in Sidereus Nuncius in March of 1610. Ah, love to see that. Very, very cool. Even with numbers, Greek letters are nowhere nearly sufficient to name all the naked eye stars visible in a constellation. A big step was taken by the English astronomer John Flamsteed, 1646 to 1719, the first astronomer royal who used a telescope to measure accurate positions of some 3,000 mostly brighter stars. His stars were posthumously mapped onto the Atlas Coelestis of 1729. Flamstein numbered his stars, so A Lyrae, Vega is also three Lyrae. I guess that's Alpha Lyrae, it's also three Lyrae. Some astronomers tried adding numbers in the Southern Hemisphere inaccessible from England, but the southern sky had so many constellations that were later dropped that the numbers never caught on. As a result, there are no Flamsteed numbers below about 35 degrees south declination. Messier, Messier's passion for astronomy was ignited when he was 13 years old, witnessing the spectacular comet Klinkenberg Chassot end 1743, begin 1744, or maybe, I guess, the other way around, I would imagine. As the later chief astronomer of the Marine Observatory in Paris, he pursued his interest in comets where he was distracted, when he was distracted by a cloudy object in the constellation Taurus. However, the object wasn't moving in the sky like a comet. This comet-like object that Messier observed was NGC 1952, commonly known today as M1, Messier 1, or the Crab Nebula. It is the first object in Messier's catalog of nebulae and star clusters. By the time of his death in 1817, Messier had compiled a list of 103 objects in the night sky using his own observations with various telescopes and the discoveries of other astronomers. The catalog was revised in the 20th century and now contains 110 objects. While the Hubble Space Telescope, 1990 to 2005, has not produced images of every object in the Messier catalog, it has observed 96 of the 110 total as of June 2018. These are the famous pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula, also known as M16 in Messier's catalog. Antares, the four guardians of heaven of the ancient Persian monarchy. 
Aldebaran, Regulus, Antares, and Fomalat. And these are in Alpha Tari, Alpha Leonis, Alpha Scorpii, and Alpha Pisces Ostrini. These are the gates. And then these are the sides, interestingly. Side being a reference to something Ra discussed in Rave Cosmology materials. Hmm, some interesting facts over here. Adding the days between Aldebaran and Altaris, or I guess Antares, a little bit of a typo. So adding the days between Aldebaran and Antares, Aldebaran Antares via Regulus, 83 plus 99 equals 182 days. Aldebaran Antares via Fomalhaut, 90 plus 93 equals 183 days. Interesting. So these are, yeah. And then the size of the seasons differ in time. Um, and relates, I'm not sure I follow this, to the procession of the equinox. I see. So this is this is as of the picture on the left is as of 3114 before Common Era. The picture on the right is 2012 AD. And we can see that the values are a little bit different, that the size of the seasons differ. Very interesting, interesting gap graphics here. Aldebaran, along with Regulus, Antares, and Fomalhaut, were the four cardinal stars, bright stars, all close to the ecliptic. They basically divided the sky into four equal parts. So doing his Google research, Jan writes, he found this very long mathematical, astrophysical kind of series of amazing calculations based on these four cardinal stars to be in perfect alignment 70,000 years ago. The most important event in the development of the potential to express consciousness took place between 85 and 90,000 years ago. Scientifically spoken, it's a mutation that's carried by the female and it's called the dropping of the larynx. It took place in the individual stream from the 39 up to the 12th gate, the gate of the potential differentiated articulation. Looking at any mutative point, you should also look at its opposition, in this case, gate 11, the gate of the experiential I. Seeing this combination, it expresses the quantum between what is to be seen and the ability to speak. Hmm, that's a really good point, that it's the combination of seeing the polarity, the 11, and then the ability to speak in the 12. The establishment of a common way to communicate what we see. Think about the language you speak in your life. It's the way you get by in the world. It's not like a sound language you made up that others don't understand. And here's a quote from Ra. Those two occurrences in time, 88,000 BCE and 50,000 BCE, may give an idea how long it took for the Maya to go from the limitation of looking at each other and trying to develop a language toolbox, making life more coordinated and more functioning, and the step to go beyond that and expand the Maya by giving names to objects in the sky. With that perfect alignment of the cardinal stars around 50,000 BCE, this could be seen as the beginning of trying to frame the whole, trying to enclose consciousness into some kind of understandable system. That is, these are the stars that awakened our interest in the whole. Hmm. Let's, uh, let's take a break now and return in the next episode. Um, of the reading group for Crash Course in Stars. Uh, I've been enjoying reading this. I hope you've been enjoying hearing it. And special thanks to Jan van Denberg for writing this incredible work. Till next time. Mm -hmm.